Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, what listeners? You know I appreciate it when you tune back in every week. Today I have Kristen Nelson from Audivy. She is a caregiver turn creator, and you know how many of those I like to talk to. So let's welcome Kristen and find out more about her. So thanks for joining me, Kristen. Thanks so much for having me. So why don't you start with your caregiver story? Um, you know, you took care of your mom with who had dementia. You right. Start there and how that led you into being a creator of something that all of us should probably use. Um, yeah. So I uh, started taking care of my mom shortly after my father died and she was diagnosed with dementia. She moved to live near me and my family at that point, And I quit my job. I had been working at uh, Partners in Health, a Boston-based nonprofit for most of my professional life and quit that to help her get settled in the transition. And she'd come over every day and I became really interested in her perseverative loops, the story she told again and again of her childhood. And I decided to record them, not really for her, but for us so that my boys would have those stories because I knew even though we know them verbatim now, I was like, someday they'll forget those stories. So I recorded them and I paired each audio of her voice telling a story a memory with one picture and I put it on a website. And that kind of would have been the end of it except I happened to show it to my mom and she became completely enraptured. She started acting out the story. She laughed the whole time. She was finishing her sentences. She didn't do what we would do, which is like, oh my gosh, do I really sound like that? She was completely captivated. And I just all of a sudden thought like, it's true. She has really profound short-term memory loss, but those long-term memories were clearly so comforting to her in like an otherwise confusing day. Um, so I decided to ultimately over the next couple of years, create an app that would let other people save their memories, audio plus a photo, and then be able to add to it or play it back. That's awesome. My mom had one loop story that she told all the time, and I can still almost say it verbatim. And it's been three and a half years since she passed. So my mom had dogs all of her life. I'm the oldest of the two kids. I'm the first grandchild on both sides. So my mom's loop story was, We've had do I've had dogs all of my life. And when I was pregnant with my first, my mother-in-law told me, well, you're going to be getting rid of the dogs now, right? So apparently that story pissed her off enough <laughs> that she remembered it even when her long-term memory was no good. And I'm wondering now, because of course, um, <clears throat> I would bring, I brought my youngest golden at the time, Remy, to the memory care. And he was awesome. I brought the older one th once and he hated it. And I never did get a chance to bring Luna, who is the one dog we have right now. Remy was awesome, but being with my mom, like my mom would see a dog or even a stuffed animal and she would launch into that story. And what's kind of funny, my listeners know that my mom, bef my mom was a Diane. She befriended other Diane and they befriended other, other Diane, because like, that's not confusing to a healthy cognitive person. <laughs> and one day my mom and other Diane were talking about this stuffed dog. And I was just observing and my mom launches into the story and other Diane goes, you've told me that story 837 times. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. That's a pretty specific number, but probably true in some respects. Mm -hmm. And then like a couple weeks later, my mom launches into the story again because she had her dog with her in memory care. And Diane Stewart started repeating it. And I thought, this is practically elder abuse. <laughs> You've told this woman this story so many times <laughs> that despite her Alzheimer's, she can now repeat this story. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I don't want to hear this story ever again, much less from yeah. both of you. <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> and I, I was just like sitting there going, this is like the weirdest La La Land I could have ever imagined being in. But I'm wondering if she had a picture. Now, we, we, like I said before we were recording, I grew up with black miniature poodles. So 
you know, they all kind of look the same, especially in photos, because, you know, a black dog with a black nose and dark eyes, pretty difficult to photograph. I'm a retired portrait photographer, so I know that firsthand. <laughs> I'm wondering if it, I guess an old family photo, because we did have photos from when um, she briefly showed poodles, you know, which sucks up your whole weekend. So once you have kids and, you know, one spouse is working, that's that's kind of a tough hobby to maintain. <laughs> I'm just kind of wondering if she would have felt the same way. I wish I could test that theory now, but what other kind of stories do you have um, that where the app has helped people with this? Well, what I was going to say about that is that my mother would tell the same stories again and again. And for any caregiver, you know, it's really hard to be on the receiving end of those stories. Like you're supposed to have a reaction or say, oh, really? Or whatever. It's very hard to interact with that. But to be beside my mother while she's listening to her own story that she loves to tell and she's laughing about it, it's a completely different experience. It takes the pressure off the caregiver. All of a sudden, you're just sort of like this byproduct on the side that she doesn't really care about your reaction. She's enjoying the story. So I say that even if people have just a few stories that their family, their loved one tells or their person with dementia tells, Record those few and just see what it does for them, because it might help sort of uh, deflect the attention from trying to tell it to you. That was my experience, and, and I've seen it with others, and it's been really nice to see that it can help decrease some of that tension. Tell the me, other thing, put, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, the other thing I would say is that like at the end of the day or during a difficult time, if my mother was sitting around and sort of looked out of sorts, like, what am I doing? What's going on? Was her constant refrain? I could give her her memory bank, turn it on, and she could just sit there. It plays sequentially all the stories. So it was, I don't know, what do you call it? A set and go activity where you could just put it in front of her. She could be engaged and she's no longer in the, what am I supposed to be doing mode? Now she's just enjoying her memory. So it can really help change the sort of tone of a of a situation or an atmosphere that makes sense my mom only had that one story other than my dad was her caregiver until he passed away because you know generational um gendered expectations he lived up to, he did not want my sister and i to help which was dumb and she always fretted about you know does she does does my husband know where I'm at? Like I would always, t I would take her to the doctor, the dentist for a long time. I would take her out to get her nails done. We did go out all, you know, like almost every visit until the end. She passed, like she passed away at the very beginning of the pandemic. So I didn't have to worry about any of that, thankfully. But she was, for the longest time, she'd fret. Does my husband know where I'm at? So it was always this like negative energy about my dad. And it took me a while because I'd say, yes, mom, dad knows where we're at. Yes, dad knows I'm taking you to get your nails done. And then she'd ask me again. And one time she asked me six times from her room to the parking lot, which was like less than a 10 minute walk and because she, she walked very slowly. It was probably more like five. By the time I got to the car, I was like, I'm about to shove this woman in the trunk or at least leave her here because I can't take this anymore. And I put her in the car and walked around and I put my hand on the driver's door and it was like a bolt of lightning hit me. And I'm like, I'm not answering her question. She wants to know if, quote, her husband knows where she's at. And I'm talking about my dad. Yes, they were the same person, but not to her. So once I said, oh, yeah, Chuck knows where we're at. She stopped asking all the time. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, I was like, once I figured that out, I was like, good night. How dumb can you be? Like, you know, uh, but and it was you know frustrating because it was always that like snarky tone of voice. So it was just that was, that was her only two kind of repetitive things. And once I started talking to her about her husband instead of my dad, then it was much easier. But the dog thing, that got hard because sometimes she'd tell that story in front of my my paternal grandmother, her mother-in-law was like, oh no, divert, yeah. divert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then the other question is, even if it isn't a perseverative loop um, for an individual who just does have old pictures or old stories that they know um, and can tell, 
even if it's not something that they tell all the time, capturing that, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of reminiscence activities now. And, you know, in Eng- uh, in uh, the Netherlands, they have those re- reconstructed old towns from the 50s and 60s where they allow them to sort of tap into that reservoir of old stories and old memories. So I've been connect- trying to connect with them to say, well, when you connect and get that, you know, you've triggered that old memory, save it in a bank. And then they can, you know, when they go home, they can hear that memory again that they just recalled through that other experience. My mom must have been much further along. Now, she had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So we dealt with it for a long time. But one of the reasons I started the show is because all of those reminiscent memory activities mm-hmm. spectacularly failed with her. Um, trying to connect through music total failure. Probably because my mom liked to listen to talk radio and talk TV. Should have just played her podcasts. Probably should have played her mine, but I was always worried she'd realize that we were either talking about her or I was always worried that it would generate some negative feelings. That was why I never did that. But I took an al- a scrapbook that my sister made. She, my sister's four and a half years younger than me. And I'm blonde and pale and have never, well, I was skinny as a kid, but not since adolescence and my sister's dark hair dark eyes olive skin never had to worry about her weight um so we don't really look alike most people don't even know we're related so it's very easy to tell us apart in photos besides the age difference we just don't look the same and my mom had no clue who any of the people in the pictures were not my sister not me not her not my dad even with her wedding album i was like this is depressing (laughs) yeah that's hard so she must she must have just been i mean her her long-term memory must have been affected when i was attempting these reminiscent activities because you know i was doing all the things people said worked and made things better (laughs) did not help at all (laughs) no i mean there's no question that one size does not fit all so um my hope is that you know, for those who either do hear the same story again and again, or who just know that their, you know, their parent or whoever it is, their person with dementia does have old reminiscences that they can save them and recycle them. Because, I mean, the other thing is that there are so few activities that really allow them to sort of tap into their deepest self. Um, And when you can get them listening to the old memories it just, you know, even as their memory fades, my mother could no longer articulate those memories anymore, but they were still there for her to enjoy over time. So I guess that's partially why my goal is to try to have people record memories as early as possible. It makes sense. And, you know, I've learned so much since I started the show, which it's been six and a half years. My mom's been gone for half that time. I'm still learning so many great things. So we're really making progress it just still feels really slow. So did your mom recognize that it was her voice or just that it was a story she like that triggered positive emotions? It's really funny you say that. I, for, In many cases, it seems like they don't recognize that it's their voice. I'd love to do research about that to sort of understand what what's going on in their brain. Um, one person I recorded, I did a memory bank for a friend's father and he was recently listening to it and he turned to me, he's smiling. He's like finishing the sentences, but then he turned to me and he said, how did they get that out of him? (laughs) That's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Another person said that her, her mom listens to it and is like, you had a white cat. I had a white cat, like sort of is like, loving and connecting with the stories that are being told, but hasn't completely put together that they're actually her stories. Um, but they just are somehow comforting. And so the the memory banks, like I said, each one is an audio memory with one picture. Um, ideally, the person has a photo that semi corresponds. But if not, we put an abstract image in because I think it's really important to engage the visual cortex while the auditory center is, you know, listening and following along on this trip down memory lane. Um, For a person with dementia like my mom, I mean, she couldn't read a book. There wasn't enough going on. She couldn't watch a movie. There was too much going on. But this sort of audio visual platform 
is what we're considering the Goldilocks sweet spot of um, of stimulation so that it, yeah, it's both engaging in the medium, the audiovisual, but also in that substance of like, oh, this is vaguely familiar and pleasurable. And, you know, a lot of people do say, yeah, my mother finishes the words to her stories. And, I'd really love to know how my mom would have reacted. That's that's the that's the one bummer. It's like I've learned some really good techniques that would have been really beneficial with her. Yeah. Um, she used to walk behind me, could not get her to walk next to me, which I understood with the visual processing. Totally understood that she would not walk elbow in elbow. She acted like that was an affront to her dignity and painful. I mean, it was just like her reaction was just atrocious. <laughs> and so she'd literally walk like ten or fifteen feet behind me shuffling along looking at her feet and i was terrified i'm like one of these days this woman is going to face plant on the sidewalk and i'm going to be the ogre because i wouldn't let this poor old lady catch up to me and i you know, it's like because <laughs> nobody would understand that it was all her so i had a guest um she's a dementia trainer and a uh, care support group facilitator and we were ch chatting before we recorded this is tammy anastasia she was on my show twice and she said, your mom was the oldest of four. I'm like, uh-huh. She goes, well, that's why she walked behind you so she could, quote, keep an eye on the kids. And I'm like, well, that's an insight I could have used a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, and I don't know how I would have reacted, like how I would have fixed the situation. Because if I stopped, she would stop. Ugh, it was so frustrating. But at least having that knowledge of this is probably why she's doing this would have made it less frustrating for me, which would have put a more positive energy out there for her. So I'm thinking it still would have improved things even if I couldn't prevent her from walking 10 feet behind me. It's right. crazy. Right. So That's that, yeah, I, I get, and I like the idea of the photo or even an abstract image because I am super visual and that mm -hmm. would keep my attention longer. If I'm listening to like I have a recording of my paternal grandmother before she passed away. My dad went to Africa twice um, with a um, International Vision Volunteers, which is loosely based with Rotary. And what they were doing, so the eye doctors was doing cataract surgeries because I guess there's a virus in the water that was causing cataracts. And you know, if you're a farmer and you can't see, it's kind of difficult to provide for your family. And you know, getting cataracts in your 40s and stuff is really not great. And so they were doing cataract surgery and then they decided the second year they were going to add dental surgeries. So they had to get a shipping container and it doesn't matter how full that thing was, it was still, it was a fixed price. So they decided that they were going to take the shipping container and turn it into a library. And my paternal grandmother was a head librarian at the local school district and an avid reader and visual, you know, artistic and all that stuff. That woman went to every garage sale, every friend of the library. If somebody closed a book at a bus stop, she'd pull over and say, are you done with that? I've got a, I got these books for this library in Africa. And I've heard that story a number of times. And she ended up in a board and care home at 102. And I'm like, this woman's not going to live forever. I have a lapel mic that plugs into my phone. So I recorded her telling that story. So... I need to use the app, download that. Can I download an audio to the app? Like it's not recorded, yeah. it's already recorded. Well, it would just be recording the recording. So you would have to have two devices where you just tap record and turn the other one on. So it could be on the computer and the app on the phone. Okay. Um, but the other thing is, is that to your point of, you know, you can't just listen to something for too long. We've actually, at this point, the audio segments can only be two minutes at a time. Mm because you want to sort of transition every two minutes with like a new photo, a new title, a new photo, a new title to help. It's really optimized for people with dementia. That makes sense. So I think this story that she told me about collecting the books for the library in Africa, which is now I believe two shipping containers. I've seen photos. Uh, my Nana, as, as she was called, um, she claimed that the library was named after my dad and I'd never heard that. Well, I've had it confirmed that they did. So I've made a video of stuff, photos and stuff from somebody else's video. But if I made, take the 10 minute talk and chopped it into two minute blocks, I could do that. Exactly. And then, and then put different pictures because the story, I, had, I, 
I knew she was instrumental on collecting books. And she only had like a short window, like a week or two maximum. It was a really short window to collect all these books. And she did. She negotiated with neighbors at garage sales. It was, I mean, it's a really, I'm so glad that I have that recording. Yes. And I tried to get her to tell me other stories about my dad. Um, like, what did they do for Halloween when, you know, my dad was the oldest of three, but he was eight years older than number two and 11 years older than number three. So the two other boys, so to speak, were closer than my, you know, eight years difference and 11 years difference is a big gap. And she didn't really seem to remember, but my uncle told a really funny story about, I guess it was, it was at least the two younger sons and my grandmother, they'd go to get ice cream and she always got vanilla. <laughs> so I, sh I should get my uncle to record that yeah. because it's, it's stories I'd never heard. It's like, you know, the woman was around for 103 years. She was around for, so she died in 21. So I was like, I think I turned 55 that, that year. So I was like 54 and a half. So I'm like, I never heard this story at all my whole life. And I've been around a little while. So even, oh. even if it's not their story, maybe like, I'm sure my grandmother would have appreciated hearing that story from her son, even though her mm -hmm. mind was fine. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. No, I mean, so, I mean, first of all, I just love the idea of collecting the stories of, you know, the books in Africa. I mean, there are just so many stories that we just lose. So ought to be also ultimately hopes to just save those precious memories for everybody. But that I'm really focused on the dimension market now. But that is a real residual benefit also is like we are just are losing these beautiful stories told in the own person's voice, which is so fun to hear. But I have also done and now I've been encouraging others to do a memory bank for someone else. So for example, my fa my husband <clears throat> and his brother and sister did a memory bank for each of their parents. So they uploaded their favorite pictures of their dad and told their favorite memories of growing up and what he used to do as a dad that they loved. And then on Father's Day, they gave it to their father and he got to hear their voice with their pictures telling their favorite memories of him as a father. So yes, you can certainly do it for somebody else. Um, somebody had said it would be really nice for those who are no longer able to speak, but you know, still have full faculty and they could hear other people tell the stories of their life for them. That's like, I've heard people say, you know, they want to have like their wake before they die so they can hear all the good stories. Yeah. People say, yeah. which makes sense. That was the one thing. Um, I didn't want to speak at my dad's funeral. I was exhausted. He'd been in the hospital for a month and then on hospice for two and a half, almost two and a half. And so I was just like, and I had to pick up his mom and take her. So I always had to deal with her and what was going on with my parents. So it was like uh, an added burden. And I just wanted to hear what other people had to say. Cause it's like my dad, well, my case, my dad was a Gemini. <laughs> so he literally was like two different people. He was very stern and kind, you know, not, not as playful at home. Sometimes he was, and those are the, the memories that I love the most, but he, he was an engineer for the phone company, but he also did 
portrait and wedding photography on the side. And he was an entirely different person at weddings. Like, who is this man? And his friends called him Chuckles. I'm like, this is not a Chuckles, okay? <laughs> Unless you're talking about a scary clown, this man is not a Chuckles. But when I got to witness him being like that, I was like, this is weird. <laughs> So it's it was nice to hear other people's reminiscences of my dad. He'd been in three or four different Rotary clubs. He'd had a kidney donation from a major in the Salvation Army, which he had done a lot of volunteer work for. So we had a lot of different segments of his life speak at his funeral, and it was really nice. It was exhausting well, too, but... <laughs> so I have also had people do... Um, <clears throat> what I've called a tribute bank for someone who has passed away. And it's exactly that people, all these people upload a photo and their favorite memory or whatever they want about that person. Because it's true when somebody dies and at the wake you hear everybody say like, oh, I loved your father because X, Y, and Z, you forget all of that. Again, we don't have it like, but to have it in a memory bank where you can go back and just sort of revel in the life of that person. So I've been encouraging people to also do it as a tribute bank. That makes sense. Um, my maternal grandmother had vascular or mixed dementia for 15 years, and my maternal great-grandmother also had dementia. So our family history is, is very splotchy. And we have dysfunction, as many families do, so there's not a lot of communication. So there's just so much lost history. It's just like, ugh, I should start, right. these, for, I should start these for my daughter because she doesn't need the... Uh, tubs of photographs this is this is the downfall when you're a photographer for 30 years you know way more photographs of people than you need <laughs> yeah i've said it is sort of like in another application is it's an annotated photo album where you just upload a photo you so with each you have a single memory bank you create a memory bank for an individual you can make it public you can make it private or you can share it with people that are already have autonomy and then you record a memory and you upload a photo or you can upload the photo and talk about it as the memory. Um, so it can essentially be like an annotated photo album of whatever time period. It doesn't have to be the best photo, but at least it's not in a box somewhere. It's in a memory bank where people can see it and share it and enjoy it. And and the life of that photo can go on past, you know, the scribbles that's on the back of some photos. Yeah. So as a definite that's one of my biggest challenges. Neither my mother or my grandmother captioned photographs. That's I been know. one of my my um like things that I attempt to do when I go through the boxes. So we've convinced people of how wonderful this app is. Now, you know, you're thinking they're thinking, "Okay, this would be great, but ugh, I'm so busy with work and caregiving and this and that. How do we convince them or how do we motivate them to actually do this because this is one of those things where people are like oh that's a great idea i should i should i should i should and then you get to the point where it's like dang it i should have done it <laughs> so, i, know. I, I mean know. so how do we motivate that that silly human nature that's all in all of us to to do this other than i've just shared reasons we've both shared reasons why we'll love to have it but do you have any suggestions on how to kind well, of push my, people over the the hump I, I, it is my big um, question for people in general and, and quandary as a, you know, somebody who's trying to get people and to do this for their own future benefit. Um, uh, two things. One is I say, when we lose our vision, we get glasses. When we lose our hearing, we get a hearing aid. We lose our memory. There is no other crutch, right? You're like brain game, Mediterranean diet, all kinds of things to slow disease progression. And I look at memory banks as the corollary or a, a, a similar um, uh, kind of a crutch that we should all be doing to help the person through the decline that they're going to be experiencing. But I think the real secret sauce is going to be in uh, the younger generations. They're the ones that they already capture everything. <laughs> Yeah. And they have the technical know-how. They go by to see a grandmother or grandfather. They probably don't know what to talk about, what to do. And if they could get involved in creating these memory banks for them, whether they need them for dementia or not, um, it'll engage them in a conversation. It'll connect to the generations. It'll be valuable to the parent. And it might be a real lifesaver or <clears throat> helpful tool 
for the grandparent down the road if they start losing their memory. So I'm trying to figure out how to um, engage the younger generation in this undertaking. What do you think? Well, I love it because they already are used to doing that. Now they just have to kind of refocus it slightly differently. But you could suggest that, you know, make it like a holiday tradition. You get together on Thanksgiving and you're laying around because like my family, <laughs> I don't know how many times I've told this story on the podcast, but we all have our favorite flavor of pie. So there can be six people at dinner and three pies, which, you know, this is a very simple math. That's a half a pie a person. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we have to have the mashed potatoes and the stuffing and, you know, it's like the green beans and the salad. It's like, so while you're laying there on the couch trying to digest your triple decker meal that you've just eaten, that's a good time to, to you know, some families play games. My family never did that. We just, I don't know what we did. Just kind of laid there and groaned. <laughs> but, you know, that's when you should whip out the app and say, hey, do take a picture of that, that specific, you know, Thanksgiving or whichever holiday you're getting together for and just have a memory about that day. And then you're at least kind of, you have to get into the habit. Once you're in the habit, then it's yeah. much easier. So now, so now every birthday, holidays, you know, whenever you get together, just make it a, make it a thing that you do part of the new yeah. tradition. Or if you visit a grandparent and they've got an old photo album, take a picture of a couple of them and just say, who is this? What's going on here? Audibly does have in the app, it's got preloaded questions uh, that you can use. So if grandkid is like, I don't know what to ask. Well, it's got questions like, where'd you grow up? What do you remember about your neighborhood? Like some really basic, simple questions, really, again, optimized for dementia. Um, but they could just grab a couple photos, get a couple memories in, and at each time you download the app. <clears throat> Um, it's in both uh, for Android or iOS. It's $19.99 for a single download. So you don't pay a monthly fee right now. It's just a single download. And you can do unlimited memories. So each time they get together with a grandparent, just ask a couple more questions and keep building. And I think of it as this like extraordinary resource that if we could really get people to do like that's a public good if we could save all these memories for all of us, but especially for anybody who is suffering from dementia, it could be a really vital tool down the road. Well, the built-in questions that are optimized for asking somebody with memory loss is super helpful. So that was that was smart. But it also, if you so if you've got younger generations that maybe, you know, they're not hands-on day to day, but they want to help out or, you know, you they they just they're there so they can help whether they're super thrilled about it or not because <laughs> none of us are real thrilled about it. This helps them kind of get over the hump of what to do and what to say. And, right. You know, right. like I took care of my grandmother one day, and in the morning she remembered who I was, and by the afternoon she was telling me not to rush into marriage, which cracked me the hell up because I think I'd been married for like thirteen or fourteen years. <laughs> A little <laughs> late on that advice, lady. <laughs> and I'm assuming she thought I was my younger cousin who is also blonde because not a lot of blondes in our family. So I had to figure out who she thought I was after I finished silently laughing at myself because it was just like, it struck me so funny, but it, you know, I had no idea how to deal with her. And thankfully that was funny and not painful, but you know, having something, you know, like your app would really have helped a lot. <laughs> Right. No, there's no question. Grandkids like don't know what to say and what, you know, and grandparents don't know what to say to little young kids. So here's like a, a tool that can help bring them together. And again, can hopefully create something great for both in the end. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. And and this is this is kind of like a little far out there, but it, it just seems like all these memories attached to photos and we and, you know, somehow they're going to get up, you know, into the greater database of the world of the internet some you know whether that whether that's what you want your app to do you, we know that's probably going to happen someday because like when after my dad passed away we were cleaning out my parents house i have like hundreds of photos i have no idea who they are i know they're related to me but i have no idea who they are and i i have to guess as to which side of the family they're from and my husband suggested so this was in 2017 to scan them and upload them to the internet and basically see if the internet could figure it out. I'm like, there's no clues. There's not like, 
these are like faces, but I bet you maybe now or 10 years from now, I bet you I could do that. That's creepy. Maybe. I just I just read with the new iPhone 15 that you can replace Siri with chat GPT. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's creepy. I like chat GPT for what I use it for. I am not going to put it on my phone. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to resist being sl a slave to the AI as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing because they have um, a service that I use for podcasters where you upload your audio, it listens to it, and it writes you show notes, three different varieties, gives you key keywords, title options, like in less than 30 minutes. It's like, yeah. wow, I can't even listen to my show that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some good things with AI and I'm wondering if, you know, at some point you can like rebuild a lost history like my family has by having these memories digitized already. I don't know. That's, that's like a way out there thought. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to discourage anybody from using the app because I'm getting all a little weird with the future <laughs> possibilities. <laughs> So have you had any other stories from other users that you can share with us before we wrap it up for the afternoon? Um, other stories that they told her about the... Just the the benefits of them using it, like what they got oh. out of it. Uh, and one other that just came up was, um, I mean, this again is just, it's not the straightforward application, um, but one of the people was found themselves in a hospital. So first of all, in the emergency room can be a very disorienting place. So if you have your memory bank, it helps bring the person right back to their own sense of self. So I use that with my mom all the time. But they were saying um, that the person got admitted to the hospital uh, and they were playing the memory bank, which was so great because it again sort of woke them up and had them, you know, following the story. But then also when the nurses came in, all of a sudden the nurses heard the story of this person who was otherwise like 89 year old male diabetic, blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh, so you're from Brooklyn. And it, again, it allows, it's, it's a bridge to connect people with these stories. Um, and finally, I'll say that I have been um, introducing it to memory care communities and saying that when somebody moves into a memory care community, you know, you should like change the sheets and get them their memory bank. Like it should be the first thing that happens. Actually, it should happen at the assisted living side. Um, but that, you know, that then is an important tool for them to share with each other, share with the staff. They were like, oh my gosh, for the overnight staff to be able to listen to memory banks and humanize these people who they don't really get to know over the course of the day. Um, for other families to get to see those memory banks. Because again, when I go into the memory care facility and see my mom, there are all these other residents. I don't know what to say to them, like yeah. other than what a nice day out or whatever. But if I start knowing their memory banks, I can come in and say like, I used to play the piano also, if I know that there's a woman who used to be a pianist. And so it allows the whole community to start knowing the memory, it like creates the relationships and cohesion for a community. So that's my other sort of focuses on communities. That would have been amazing because my mom had, so when she moved into memory care, we filled out like a form that talked about, it was like details about her and her life. Yeah. Um, pretty sure it, it had like some historical information. Yeah. It's been yeah. a little while since I filled that yeah, out. <laughs> um, and I, so is that typical of most of them? Okay. Yeah. So I would sometimes, if for if if for whatever reason, my occasionally my mom would get in a snit and walk away, and then I would just go down the hall and read the people that I interacted with. I would try to learn more about them, but it never it was never enough. It was like it was too basic, I guess, because it wasn't really anything to like hang a a commun uh, you know a connection on which that would have been really helpful because I was there a lot and, you know, it was just yes. crazy. And it so definitely, the, it would have helped the staff because my mom got really aggressive at the end and they kept saying, well, your mom's so easy going. I'm like, no, <laughs> she did not go from easygoing to obnoxious. 
she's always been like this. <laughs> you know, it's like, you guys uh-huh. don't know her. I'm like, I, I would just tell the staff because they were, for the most part, the ones I was really close to were younger. And I'd say, man, you didn't grow up with her as a teenager. And they'd laugh because they could remember their teenage years. And, you know, yeah. then it kind of gave them a hint. But yeah, no, that would have been really helpful. Or Or guests in your home, maybe old friends that haven't been around for a while that are apprehensive. Because, you know, it's hard to talk to somebody that's got memory loss because they repeat the same things or, you know, they tell you, well, don't quiz them. Don't ask them a bunch of questions. And it's like, but that's right. kind of how you start a conversation. like so. Right. So if you sit with them and listen to the memory bank, it allows you to laugh and connect and maybe ask a question or for maybe they follow up. The other thing about um, in the community. So they do say that, you know, all communities ask for the historical information, but you're reading a book. It's like. Did Mary Jane ride horses or was that Alicia who was the pianist? I mean, it's sort of in one ear and out the other. When you watch an audio memory bank, I, I mean, I wish I was playing one for you. Um, when you when you learn something in a multimedia fashion, we're more inclined to remember it. So when you listen to these stories and you see this beautiful old picture of Harriet as a five-year-old and hear her tell the story about going to New York on the train... You'll remember Harriet going to New York on a train. If you had read it on a piece of paper, you might remember the story. You probably won't remember who said it. So I think it's a really great tool because of the multimedia. Again, the, we're more inclined to remember that information. And it's just super sweet anecdotes that they have come up with. It's not necessarily the most important thing, like where they went to college, but it's the memory that they care about. So it's nice. That's awesome. So you said you could download this nineteen ninety nine either the the Google App Store or the Apple App Store. I think right. It's Google. I've never used. I've always been an Apple person. <laughs> Google Play or the Google. Apple Store. Okay. Both thank you. There, yes. Um. And I uh, yeah nineteen ninety nine for a single download, which I know is nineteen dollars ninety nine cents too much for an app because apps are always free these days, but. Uh, for what I consider to be a really important dementia care tool. I hope that people will spring for what is essentially a, a, a lunch treat or something, equivalent of a lunch. Heck, these days, lunch, I I go back to my old hometown to get my haircut and visit the daughter. And I just start bringing my own lunch with me because it's like to stop for 30 or so minutes and spend 25 bucks on a sandwich and an iced tea is like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I leave the house and spend money like crazy. So I 20 know. bucks is cheap for memories. Exactly. Exactly. Save them forever. Exactly. Well, I appreciate this is, um, you have a website. So is that Audivy? Uh, it's www.audivy.world world okay i knew i was like i remembered there was something else in there that besides yeah there was not a dot com that's that will be helpful so i'll make sure that's in the show notes people can go to the app store and check it out but i hope we've convinced you to start a new family tradition um with the holidays coming up and you know birthdays my mom's birthday was in january so we could have done this then um just as a memory that I will never forget. So other Diane's birthday was October 29th. I will never forget that because she was always telling me she was two days shy of a witch. (laughs) Perfect visual without the photograph, but I will never, never forget that. And she loved chocolate so much. I just always picture like a chocolate witch two days before Halloween. So that's so funny. So you can even save memories from people that you interact with on a regular basis. And, you know, cause they're, they're fun. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>